Okay. Um, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Dr. Gerald Anda. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon in the New Jersey area. Um, I specialize in hip replacements, knee replacements, and general orthopedics. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about hip and knee arthritis, um, and we have some commonly asked questions here that I'm going to go over with you. So we're going to just uh, jump right into that after I tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Ghana, West Africa. I grew up there. Uh, I moved to the United States in uh, 2008, um, where I went to Penn, uh, University of Pennsylvania, did my undergrad medical school and training there, moved to New York for a fellowship where I uh, studied and learned hip and knee replacements with minimally invasive techniques and robotic assisted surgeries. All right, so um, let's jump into the commonly asked questions. What causes osteoarthritis of the hip joint? So um, osteoarthritis of the hip joint, you can think of as wearing away of the cartilage. Um, so when your cartilage starts to wear away because of activity over your lifespan, um, that's what you can think of as arthritis. There are different ways that that can happen. Sometimes if you have an injury to your hip when you're younger, um, that can start the process of the cartilage wearing away. But sometimes there's no injury at all, and it's just something that happens over time as we, as we grow older. Cartilage isn't like um, other tissues in your body like skin or even hair that can regrow or heal themselves. The cartilage wears away and it's gone. And so that's when you start to uh, have the symptoms of what uh, is known as arthritis in your hip and or your knee. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to the next question, which is what are the symptoms of osteoarthritis of the hip? Now, osteoarthritis of the hip can present in many ways. Um, it can present with pain, uh, which is probably the most common uh, symptom. So pain in your hip with activity, uh, a lot of times with walking or weight bearing, with bending your hip, uh, that can cause uh, some pain. Um, and then difficulty with activities such as bending down to tie your shoelace, climbing up and down stairs, and just, you know, doing your daily, da daily activities in general. Uh, some of the other symptoms of osteoarthritis are difficulty moving your hip around. So besides the pain, just difficulty actually moving the hip can be a sign that you have osteoarthritis. Another sign that you could have osteoarthritis in your hip is feeling um, some discomfort when the temperature changes. So a lot of times patients will complain of changes in pain in their hip and or knee uh, when the temperature changes. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case um, in one of the other questions. Um, but pain and limited, you know, range of motion or limited movement of your hip um, are one of the most common symptoms of um, hip osteoarthritis. Um, so when you get osteoarthritis of your hip, how is it treated? There is a spectrum of ways that we can treat um, hip osteoarthritis. And even though we're surgeons, even though I'm a surgeon, surgery is the last resort. So we always try what we call conservative management first. And that begins with taking stuff like anti-inflammatory medications. And there are ways that, you know, we counsel patients on how to take these anti-inflammatory medications that can actually help uh, some of the mild cases of osteoarthritis. There is also activity modification. So pain is our body's biggest indicator that we're doing something wrong. So when we, act, when we modify our activity to adjust for the pain that we're having, um, it can actually make us feel a little bit better. So anti-inflammatory medications, activity modification, and then another one is physical therapy. So physical therapy is a strong tool that we use to treat osteoarthritis, especially mild and moderate osteoarthritis of the hip, um, because what that does is strengthen the muscles around your hip. It strengthens your core. It strengthens the muscle that you use to move your leg to the side and back and twist your leg. And sometimes that helps to hold the hip joint in the proper position and helps us feel a little bit better. So that's one of the conservative ways that we can treat um, osteoarthritis of the hip. If that doesn't work, we sort of escalate it to the next step in the treatment algorithm, and that you know uh, comes with injections in the hip. Now, a lot of people have heard about injections that uh, are used to treat osteoarthritis of the hip and the knee, 
Um, and we have a couple options. One option is a steroid injection, which is probably the more common option. And it's a combination of a steroid and a numbing medication that's injected directly into your hip, um, into the hip joint. And the point of that is you can think of it as putting a thousand Tylenols right into your hip. It's meant to calm down the pain and the inflammation. And the numbing medication helps numb the pain, um, which can give patients long lasting relief. Now, sometimes if the arthritis is bad enough, that doesn't work. And then we can try uh, something called called a gel injection, which is um, basically what it sounds like. It's a gel that's injected into the hip, and the point is to provide lubrication. So kind of like when you're oiling your car or, you know, oiling knobs or doors or anything like that, you're providing um, less friction when the bones are rubbing on each other because as the cartilage wears away, the bones start to rub on each other, and that's what causes the pain. Now, if we try all these things, including anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, activity modification, and injections, and none of that helps a lot of the time in severe cases of osteoarthritis, surgery is a pretty good option. And surgery is our last option. And so hip replacement surgery um, is a very good way of treating uh, osteoarthritis of the hip. Hip replacement surgery was actually... Um, voted the surgery of the century because it's so effective at treating this uh, condition. Now, um, surgeons like myself uh, do a minimally invasive direct anterior um, total hip replacement surgery, which provides um, a heightened uh, recovery in the first two weeks after surgery. So a lot of times, because this is a muscle sparing approach, patients feel like they are, are able to get up quicker and start moving around quicker after surgery. So um, we can move on to the next question, which is what are some of the causes of pain in the hip and knee? So besides osteoarthritis, there are definitely other things that can cause pain in your hip and or your knee. So all of our joints are surrounded by what we call soft tissues. And osteoarthritis is mainly a problem with your bones. Now, you can have a problem with the soft tissues in any of these joints, being your hip or your knee, and those can cause you pain. Now, in your knee, you have a meniscus, which is you can think of as a shock absorber, ab absorber uh, that's in your knee. It prevents the bones from banging on each other when, every time that we walk. Those can sometimes get torn, and those can, get, uh, can cause us pain. It causes us pain because they get torn and then they get caught when we're moving our knee and it tugs on all the other sensitive structures in, in our knee and that's what causes us pain. Now in the hip, we have a labrum which helps hold the hip joint in place. Uh, sometimes, again, that labrum can get torn and you can, start, you can start to have pain from that because of the catching of the labrum when you move around your hip. Now, if you have... Um, we all have tendons around our hip and our knee, and sometimes those tendons can get inflamed. And just like anywhere else in your body, when you get inflammation or swelling uh, that affects these structures, it can cause us pain. So those are some of the most common reasons why you can get pain in your hip or your knee. Now, if you've had a previous injury to your hip or your knee, that injury can sort of start the cascade or the process of the cartilage wearing away and can develop what we call post-traumatic arthritis. So if you hurt yourself when you're a child, you know, uh, playing basketball, if you think you're Michael Jordan or if you're playing soccer or whatever it is, um, and you hurt yourself later on in life, that can come back as post-traumatic arthritis. Okay. All right. So what options are available for a patient who has severe, sometimes called bone-on-bone -bone arthritis throughout the knee? So similarly to the hip, the, there is a spectrum um, of things we can do to treat arthritis in the knee. Um, we always start with the conservative things, but if you have what we call bone-on-bone -bone arthritis or very severe arthritis, then most often surgery is the best um, resolution. Surgery is the only resolution that will take away the arthritis. All of these other conservative uh, management things that we discussed, including the injections, physical therapy, are ways that we can help treat your symptoms. Surgery fixes the problem. 
So if you have knee arthritis, that's severe or bone on bone, a total knee replacement is probably the best option for you. Now, there are there have been many advances in the procedure the, that we use to do a total knee replacement, including robotic assisted technology. So one of the uh, advantages of um, having a knee replacement now is that we currently use robots um, to assist us in surgery. Um, and the way they assist us is by um, making sure that we're putting our implants uh, within one millimeter increments of, of precision um, and that we're balancing the knee to within one millimeter as well. And so that's very, very specific, a lot more specific than the naked eye can be, which is what, you know, how we're doing it before. But that replaces the bones that are damaged from the arthritis and gives patients long lasting relief. Um, okay, so next question says, what is fluid on the knee and what is a joint effusion? So um, the reason I, I, one of the reasons I got into orthopedics is because your, your joints, especially your hips and your knees are very specific. So when you have pain at a particular part of your knee or your hip, it's most likely because something is wrong at that particular point. And your knee um, and your hip know how to tell us when something is going wrong. So these joint effu uh, effusions or fluid on the knee is your knee's way of telling us that there is something wrong inside your knee. If you have an injury, if you have a torn meniscus, if you have arthritis, if you have any condition that affects your knee, um, you, your, what your body does is create what we call synovial fluid or joint fluid. Um, so you're, when these, when this fluid collects in your knee, we know that there's something that your knee is upset about. And that's when it's good for you to go to the doctor and, um, get, you know, further tests done so we can figure out what it is that it is wrong with your knee. Okay. So that's when you, when, uh, your doctor says that you have a joint effusion, it means that you have fluid in your knee that, that was developed by your synovium, which is just the lining of your knee that, that sort of creates all this fluid. All right. Um, next question is, will a cortisone shot help delay hip or knee replacement? Uh, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier on. Um, the cortisone shots are meant to control the pain that you have in your hip or your knee from arthritis. Now, there is no uh, literature or evidence to tell us how long that's going to happen. So there are some patients who get a cortisone shot and they get long lasting relief for months. Um, there are some patients who probably have severe arthritis who get a cortisone shot and it lasts a couple days. Um, there's no real way of predicting which patients are going to get long lasting relief versus um, no relief. But in patients that have severe arthritis, the injections, uh, cortisone injections are more likely to provide minimal relief at that point in time. Um, the cortisone injections, because of safety uh, for our patients, can be done about four times a year, about uh, three months apart. And if you do have a cortisone injection, you do have to wait three months until you have any replacement, either be it a hip or a knee. Okay. Um, and so we'll move on to the next question. Does hip replacement improve range of motion. Now, hip, uh, hip replacement absolutely improves range of motion. And this is because a lot of the time with hip arthritis, you have bone spurs forming. And when bone spurs form in your hip or even in your knee in places where there's not supposed to be bone, it prevents you from moving the way your body was naturally meant to move. And the things that we do during a hip replacement are remove some of these osteophytes or bone spurs, which allow you to move your hip the way that you're supposed to. Right. So um, getting a hip replacement does absolutely improve your uh, range of motion. What exercises can help relieve joint pain? So um, to be general, uh, the exercises that are going to help relieve your joint pain, be it your hip or your knee pain, are exercises that are going to strengthen the muscles around your hip and your knee. So I'll, I'll talk about those individually. The hip, um, 
the muscles that make you flex your hip or bend your hip up, um, once you strengthen those muscles, you're going to feel a little bit better, especially if you have mild arthritis in your hip um, in your hip joint. Now, strengthening your core and working on your balance and your um, gait and posture are all things that can also help pain because those are things that can throw off your hip joint and cause pain. So strengthening your core, strengthening your hip flexors, strengthening your uh, buttock muscles, so the muscles that extend your leg and move your leg to the side, strengthening all the muscles around your hip are things that are going to um, help you relieve some of that hip pain. And that's what the therapists are really good at, at showing us. Now for your knee, um, the, there, is, there are two major groups of muscles that cross your knee and help us move our knee around. That's your, your quadricep muscles, which are in the front of your thigh, and your hamstring muscles, which are in the back of your thigh. Strengthening those muscles are going to do a lot for helping you stabilize your knee and relieve some of that knee pain, even if you do have mild osteoarthritis. Now, if it's more moderate or severe, sometimes even those, even those exercises don't help. Um, so next question is, can joint replacement be done with minimally invasive surgery? And the answer is absolutely. And that is what uh, one of the um, focuses of my training, that's one of the focuses of uh, the things that we uh, look to to do for our patients now. And so I specialize in doing minimally invasive direct anterior total hips. And so I make a, a um, an incision in the front of your hip, which is about six centimeters long. Um, and we go, like I said, we do a muscle sparing approach. And so we're not cutting through any muscles. We are going in between the muscles, which is a minimally invasive uh, technique that helps patients re recover uh, much better. And even for the knees, we do an approach where we are able to uh, spare a lot of the uh, muscles, tendons, and ligaments in your knee that are important for your range of motion of your knee and function. And so um, joint replacements can absolutely be done minimally invasive. And in fact, most uh, people are doing minimally invasive joint replacements in today's age. Okay. And um, let's see. How can osteoarthritis of the hip be prevented? Uh, that's always a tricky question, and uh, patients ask me that a lot. But osteoarthritis is, is something that sometimes has a genetic component, and it's also sometimes just something that happens with age. So there's nothing you can really do to prevent osteoarthritis of your hip or your knee, and I wouldn't advise that patients live their life trying to prevent that either because um, you can be living your life, like I said, doing absolutely nothing and still develop osteoarthritis of your hip and or your knee, and you can live your life, you know, playing basketball or football or whatever sport or, you know, just running all day every day and not develop arthritis in your hip or your knee. And so there's no real way to predict it. We do know that there are some genetic components to it, but um, there isn't a real way to prevent um, osteoarthritis of your hip or your knee. Now, if you have an injury, to your hip or your knee, it is makes the most sense to have it addressed so that you know later on down the line that doesn't come back uh, to develop as post traumatic arthritis as we talked about. Uh, now, why does the weather affect uh, my osteoarthritis symptoms? It's another common question that uh, I get about uh, arthritis, um, and it happens to a lot of people. So, without getting too technical. Um, we all have fluid in our joints, like we mentioned. And there is also fluid and water in the tendons and ligaments and cartilage that surround our joints. Now, when the temperature drops, the thickness of that water and the sort of fluidity of that water changes. And so you can imagine that when the barometric pressure in the air or because when the temperature drops, the composition of that liquid changes into a thicker substance, and so it causes a little bit more pain in patients who have arthritis because um, the composition of those ligaments and tendons are changing, and so the temperature drops, the composition and water content of these drop, and it causes pain 
you know, because of the already damaged cartilage that's in the knee, already uh, already damaged cartilage or meniscus or ligaments that are in the knee. All right, and then the last question, what are some appropriate exercises for someone with uh, osteoarthritis? So again, um, being as active as possible is always going to be the better route. Um, some of the specific exercises that you can do, especially for knee arthritis, is straight leg raises or any exercise that strengthens your quad muscles. Now, um, that can be in the form of straight leg raises, that if you're active enough to you know, go to the gym and do some closed chain exercises, uh, which means you know, exercises that have your lower extremity or your foot actually touching something, rather than just you know using weights to move your leg around uh, with your leg not being supported by anything. Those exercises are going to help you strengthen your, um, strengthen the muscles around your knee and will help with the pain that you're, you're feeling from osteoarthritis. Um, similarly, in the hip, core strengthening. So strengthening your core um, is going to help um, with, the, with the osteoarthritis in your hip. Um, because it's going to help with your posture, it's going to help with the muscles that support your your pelvis and your hip, and it's going to help uh, relieve some of that pain. So resisted um, exercises such as moving your leg to the side to strengthen your abductors, which are the muscles that move your leg to the side, and again, strengthening your uh, glute muscles, which are your buttock muscles, which help extend your leg, and then also strengthening the uh, muscles that flex your leg up or bring your knee closer to your chest. Now, besides strengthening the muscles, stretching the muscles is also very important. So stretching your, your hamstrings, your quadricep muscles, your hip flexors, extensors, and rotators. Stre stretching all of those muscles is going to allow them to be loose enough to move around the way that they should. Um, and besides that, um, gait training. So Fixing your posture, fixing your gait are all things that are going to help um, relieve some of that pain that you have from osteoarthritis. All right, I think that was the last of the questions we have written down. Okay, so one question that came in online was, saw treatment on decompression treatment for the knee, any value in doing that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Saw treatment on decompression for the knee, any value in doing that? So the question was, they sought treatment for decompression of the knee, and is there any value in doing a decompression of the knee? Now, sometimes if you have what we call avascular necrosis, um, or if the blood vessels in your knee are not providing blood to your knee the way that they should, sometimes doing a decompression can be helpful. Now, admittedly, this is more common in hips, and is more uh, reliably able to relieve pain in hips than in knees. So uh, for knees, a lot of times, if you have what we call avascular necrosis and you are of a certain age, um, having it treated conservatively, conservatively until the point where you're ready to have a knee replacement might be the better option. If you're young enough, there are ways that uh, that can be treated, uh, core decompression being one of them. Can contraceptive medication affect female bone density? So that's a good question. Uh, contraceptive uh, medication affects your estrogen levels, which absolutely does affect your uh, bone quality. And so that is one thing that can affect it. Now, there have been several advancements to the, uh, in, you know, the contraceptive industry to make these medications less likely to have these side effects. But in theory, yes, that is something that can happen. How soon after surgery can I resume my normal daily activities? So after surgery for a hip, uh, let me repeat the question. Um, how soon after surgery can I re resume my uh, normal daily activities? So after a hip or knee replacement, you're able to walk on your hip or your knee the same day. So in theory, if I did the hip replacement or a knee replacement, you know, at one o'clock, at two o'clock, you'd be able to put, you know, full weight on your leg. Now, you'll obviously be in pain from the surgery, and so we have you working with a therapist the day of and the day after surgery. I tell my patients it takes about 
six weeks to eight weeks to get to about 80 to 90 percent of your previous activity, um, a lot of patients get there much sooner. What is hip resurfacing? So hip resurfacing is a technique of hip replacement that does not um, enter the what we call canal or the you know inner side of the uh, femur. So you can think of it as shaving around the edges of the bone and replacing that with metal rather than cutting off the neck and head of the femur and inserting an implant into the canal of the femur. This is done for younger patients, um, and it's done for patients with adequate bone quality. It's also done for patients who may have uh, had um, implants placed in their femur through their knee, and so there isn't enough space to put an implant into their uh, femur from the top or the hip joint. What are the potential complications from hip surgery? So what are the potential complications from hip surgery? Um, with any surgery that you have, anytime you make an incision in the skin, there's a risk of infection. Um, but we give antibiotics through your IV one hour before the surgery and for 24 hours after surgery to reduce that risk. We also use special solutions during surgery um, that have uh, bacteria-killing properties to make sure that we are uh, maintaining a sterile and bacteria-free uh, environment during surgery. So get, uh, an infection is one of the risks, but it's even less than 1% of the time that that happens. Um, some of the other complications are um, sometimes if the bone is weak um, in older patients who um, tend to have these operations, sometimes the bone can crack a little bit when the implants are being put in. Now, that doesn't always change anything after surgery. It's more of a technical thing for your surgeon to deal with, um, but it's something that, you know, you should be aware of as a patient. Um, having these kinds of surgeries, because these are major surgeries, can increase the risk of you having a blood clot um, in your leg. And so we actually give anticoagulant uh, therapy to patients for about six weeks after, th after surgery to help reduce that risk. There is also a very, very small risk of damage to blood vessels or nerves around the area. But with the minimally invasive techniques that we do, we're able to avoid all of those blood vessels and nerves in the, in the important areas and still do the surgery successfully. So it reduces that, the risk of that happening even further. Okay. So again, my name is Dr. Gerald Anda. I'm an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in hip and knee replacements and general orthopedics. I work with the KL Medical Group. I'm here at Pascag Valley Medical Center. <laughs> and uh, it was my pleasure to help educate you guys on hip and knee um, arthritis today. Okay, one more question because you guys are so eager. <laughs> Is the closure still done with staples? So the closure is done with staples in some places. Um, the way that I do my closure is with a mesh and glue that help hold the skin together so that you don't have the deformity that we actually call tr uh, railroad tracks with staples. So you, I, I don't use staples in my hip replacements. For some complex knee replacements where the skin is uh, more fragile, we will use uh, staples to close that because the mesh or some of the other um, neater closures are not going to hold your skin as well. So our number one priority is always patient safety, and we can do the more cosmetic closures as long as patient safety has been achieved. <laughs>